there's a very beautiful account of a conversation between Osho and the leading poet at that time, Sumitranandan Pant, in which the poet asks Osho to name 12 of the biggest influences on Indian spiritual thought and practice. And Osho said it is a very difficult task because India offers so many gems. How am I going to choose just 12? But he said, you know, you're an astute thinker and philosopher and I'm sure you will have justifications in choosing these 12. And Osho says, all right, and he presents, which according to him, are the 12. Because he knows Sumitranandan Pant is also extremely aware and sensitive and knows about these subjects. So after Osho presents the 12 gems, Sumitranandan tells him, now please crunch the number down to 7. And Osho says that's going to be an unfair task because all 12 are revered. But if you must insist, I will crunch them down. And so he brings the figure down to 7. And once again, the poet argues that why did you drop so and so? Why did you drop so and so? And he gives his answers. I think you can read about this on the internet. Then the poet asks Osho, now you reduce this number down to 5. And Osho says, now it's you're making my task extremely difficult. But if you insist, these are the five. And then the poet says, now you bring it down to four. So he says, look here, I will bring them down to four, but below that I won't go. Because these four are the four pillars of Indian spiritual thought and practice. Now, in this whole process of reducing the list, Osho has had to let go of names like Lord Rama, names like Mahavira, and he gives his reasoning why. But he says that without these four, the structure will collapse. And so, these four which he mentioned were Krishna, Patanjali, the Buddha, and the least known perhaps was Goraknath. And so then Osho asks, uh, Sumitranandan Pant asks Osho why Gorakshnath made it to the shortlist and such big names you have eliminated. And he said, because what I did in the process of elimination was I had to separate the seeds from the trees and these four planted seeds. They were seeds themselves and many trees sprouted from them. For example, he said even Krishnamurti sprouted from the seed of Buddha. They are saying nothing different. But Goraknath by far has offered India and the world the largest number of ways and practices to reach the divine. Nobody has achieved what he has achieved. And unfortunately, 
trees are remembered but not the seeds and then he mentions one line of goraknath which is die o yogi die it begins with that and then osho goes on to explain what goraknath meant by that because each and every technique of goraknath was driven to only that one point which is the story of when someone went to goraknath and said i want to take my life and he said go ahead but you will be surprised that you will find yourself still living after you die so the man is extremely confused he said firstly all the other masters have told me not to take my life and you are telling me to go ahead and now you are telling me it is of no use to take my life because even if i take my life i will be surprised to find that i am still alive so goraknath says to him that taking your life is not the true death or dying is not the true death if you really want to commit real suicide you stay with me and i will show you how to die before you die because if you die before you die then you will understand that there is no such thing as death and that's how then osho goes on to talk about the importance of goraknath and his message on dying to the duality of life goraknath had established the navnath sampradaya some say it existed before his time but he was by far the biggest influence in spreading this message across the length and breadth of the country on just this one thought how to reach the formless consciousness the unmanifest absolute in this life because as he said that if you want to take your life please do not think that all your problems all your vasanas all your samskaras will finish with that it will continue with the only difference being that you have dropped the body is there any point in that is there any point in incarnating again and again and again and again with the same thoughts the same issues the same patterns so his emphasis was on this die before you die to find there is no death or as nisargadatta maharaj would say the whole thing is about dying now to the now and maharaj would also tell people you know who were wanting to take their lives that please understand that it is not just the physical body which needs to drop it is even the subtle body because that is where everything is carried we are just seeing the grossest physical sheath one of the five sheaths is visible to us and we mistake this for who we are so this is the gift of the indian spiritual tradition and it is truly a gift to even be exposed to such teachings which very few have the privilege to be exposed to them read about them 
listen to them and what is the whole foundation of this thought the foundation is very simple if you just closed your eyes it's such a simple thing you will see that any thought about anyone or anything is arising in your individual consciousness any thought you don't like someone you don't like the situation you are in whatever be the thought that thought is arising in consciousness but when you open your eyes suddenly it becomes outside and inside suddenly it becomes split but if you truly deeply saw anything i think anything i say anything i listen to is a movement in consciousness this split starts reducing and diminishing this is the journey to non duality if your constant mantra is about hating people you need to understand that that's arising in your own consciousness it has got really nothing to do with someone outside your own consciousness what is the thought what are the words which you are constantly repeating during the day and if you just sat for 5 10 minutes at the end of the day and close your eyes and let that same repetition happen whatever it may be and the understanding comes that this is arising in consciousness what mantras have you been chanting throughout the day you start shedding light on that what are the patterns what are the thoughts what are the fears what are the hopes what are the aspirations but the realization dawns that this is all within consciousness they don't arise when i'm in deep sleep all this stuff is not there in deep sleep because the me does not exist in deep sleep they arise in dreaming and in the waking state this journey which is a simple journey of looking at yourself instead of pointing fingers at the world and yourself looking at things in a very simple way with a simple understanding this is the journey towards peace then this whole dialogue of blaming hating condemning a people as well as yourself starts reducing being swayed by the pleasures and pains of life starts reducing because you know duality is pleasure and pain what are we doing we are all running away from pain trying to just ensure there's pleasure 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 which is a counterfeit pleasure why because it does not last 
then you realize is there truly any point in this running away from stuff that I don't like? Why not just accept it and then do what I think and feel is right by all means. But when one understands that life will be polarities and duality, we are part of this game, part of up and down, left and right, black and white, big and small, rich and poor, front and back. That is the dimension of duality. That is where we are. But what we do is we split this into what part we like and what part we don't like. And so the me and the other, which is the original state, becomes me versus the other. And what is the foundation of this? When I feel that individuals are doing something which I like or they are doing something which I don't like. You did this to me. I did this to you. Doership is the foundation of this split. And if the understanding sinks deep that nobody truly does anything, why? Why does nobody truly do anything? Just as the same electricity in your kitchen functions through each and every gadget, bringing about what that gadget is designed to bring about. The toaster will produce toast. The fridge will cool the food. The juicer will make juice. Similarly, we are all instruments through whom consciousness functions. Everyone has been designed by the divine. They have been born in a particular environment like you. Social, economic, gone to certain schools, have a set of parents who have influenced their thinking, their conditioning. Their conditioning has been created by factors which were not in their control. When we are children, we are not determining all this. This is what sets up our conditioning through which we see the world. This becomes our filter. So when this understanding sinks in, when you have that knowledge that this person is saying things based on his conditioning, his genetics, how God has made him, then what happens? the foundation of doership starts crumbling because you stop blaming people and you stop blaming yourself because you know that it is the same divine light which is functioning through them as well as you. That is seeing through the eyes of non-duality, if you were to use that phrase. Your vision changes. The teaching sinks in slowly, slowly, slowly. Sometimes maybe overnight. And then what do you find that what things used to upset you earlier no longer upset you. All the dialogue which was going on here starts reducing. Because those same thought patterns about people and I don't like this one and I don't like things this way, those wheels start slowing down. Why? 
because you have realized that this is a play of the divine. What happens? Something very beautiful happens. The thinking mind, which is weighing us down so much, starts disengaging. And then when there are parrots outside the window, you realize, my God, there's a parrot outside the window because you're not lost in the dream of thinking. You are more present. Presence and conscious presence starts increasing in <coughs> daily life. It was always there. But now that the thinking mind is reduced to just being in the moment, what is that? Nothing but conscious presence. Think the parrot wants to speak. It's telling me to shut up. Parrots are called the birds of wisdom. Did I tell you all the joke about the parrot and the burglar? So, there was a burglar who had been watching over a bungalow for a long time and he saw that its owners were on holiday, very rich owners. So, he decided to loot the bungalow. And he it was so easy because nobody was there. So, he took his sack and went in, took all the expensive jewelry items, packed everything up in a very comfortable manner and walked out. And suddenly he heard a voice which said, Jesus is watching. So he was quite shaken up. So he said, maybe, you know, my inner voice is telling me that this is not the right thing to do, but I mean, I don't care. And he walked another 10 steps away from the bungalow. And again he heard a voice saying, Jesus is watching. So this freaked him out a bit. So he said, my God, I've never once thought what I'm doing is wrong. So I better pay attention to this. And he said, I'll give it one last chance. And he walked even further and the voice became louder. Jesus is watching. So he turned around. He said, is someone saying this to me? And he could not see anyone in the dark. But he did see a movement in the window upstairs and he could see wings flapping. And he looked closely and it was a parrot. So he burst out laughing. He said, I'm so stupid. I thought it was my inner voice saying Jesus is watching and it was this stupid parrot. But he was impressed it was a talking parrot. So he turns around with his loot and walks back to the bungalow. And he says, he looks up, he sees the parrot and he says, Parrot, you did an unbelievable job. What's your name? Wondering whether the parrot will respond. And the parrot says, my name is James. So the burglar bursts out laughing. 
he says what kind of stupid owners will name their parrot james and the parrot replies the same stupid owner who calls his bulldog jesus and we know what happens next so when man understands this one starts living the teaching of non duality so to speak some days are good some days are not good did god did not guarantee that each day is going to be exactly the way you like it to be everyone will fit in with your idea of how they should be and so what starts happening is in life more and more witnessing starts happening sakshi bhav as the word witnessing because there is now a wedge between being which is this awareness of what's happening and what is happening my teacher ramesh balsekar had a very beautiful sentence on what was true meditation he said true meditation is the witnessing of whatever arises as movements in consciousness true meditation not a practice of half an hour or one hour but a living practice true meditation is the witnessing of whatever happens as movements in consciousness because for anything to be there and happen you have to be present for it to happen that part has been overlooked that is the witness and witnessing is nothing but peace because witnessing is witnessing what is it's taking you away from what should be and what should have been it truly means being still not in, a, in an imaginary future and not in a dead past
Maharaj had used the term reversing into the future. We are all reversing into the future. We are going back to where we came from. What does reversing into the future really mean in simple words? So far we have been thinking that A leads to B, B leads to C, C leads to D. This happened and then this happened and then this happened and then this happened in my life. But when the dimension of seeing changes the understanding becomes clear that for D to happen, C had to happen. And for C to happen, B had to happen. And for B to happen, A had to happen. So the way of seeing changes, your old seeing of cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect starts dropping away. You start viewing life differently. That's a fresh seeing with fresh eyes. Now it appears that I am talking to y'all, but it's the same thing. If you closed your eyes, this voice is arising in your own consciousness. Is it separate from you? Is this voice separate from you or is it not part of your consciousness? So why not consider that part is talking to your own self? That part which loves you, means well for you, is talking to yourself to make life simpler for you, make life more meaningful. It may not make life easier because we all have our challenges to face, but it will make it less complicated. Why not give it a chance? And then you will see that all your repetitive mantras which have been going on unconsciously change to the acceptance of what is. Thy will be done becomes the mantra. Nobody left to hate, nobody left to blame, nobody to be jealous or envious of. Why? It's God's will. The mantra changes. I was with a friend of mine. He is Maharashtrian and an expert on mantras. He's written many books. He, I've really forgotten how he does it, but he takes your name, works out a calculation and then a mantra which vibrates at the same frequency. Numbers, he uses numbers and all. And one day we were 
taking a walk on marine drive and we sat down for 10 minutes. So he was telling me that mantras are so powerful. He said, Gautam, that if you were reciting a particular mantra and then you got up from here and left, there is a vibrational imprint where you were sitting. which sometimes he can hear because thoughts and words are vibrations. Thoughts and words are vibrations. And if you ask me, the vibration of thoughts is more powerful than the vibration of words because thoughts are closer to silence. First is silence, then is the thought, and then is the word which escapes the lips. <coughs> Thoughts and thinking. So what mantras are going on in our minds? Invariably mantras of separation. There is no point doing a jap and the rest of the day you are embroiled in all this doership which you have thrust upon people as well as yourself. Mantras are very powerful because mantra literally means to free the mind. Mantra. Not that God is going to give you what you want because you're doing the mantra. In terms of material things. It's a beautiful concept, mantras in Indian thought. It's so beautiful, but the importance needs to be seen. Where do these come from? What is behind them? They are vibrations.
Look at the words you are constantly repeating. They are good pointers to know what's coming up. Or the thoughts which you feel are constantly in my mind. Explore those. And you will be surprised to find that almost all, if not all of them, are fear-based. Because the me is threatened. The Buddhists are so right in saying all fears are the fear of death. Each and every fear. What this teaching does is tells you, yes, it is the fear of death of the me. The me who thinks he is the doer of his actions, like others are. But it's a paradox because we have no problem sleeping at night and we don't know if we'll wake up the next morning. There's no, no fear of that temporary death. And as Ramesh would say, death is nothing but your deep sleep extended eternally. Would you have a problem with that? Especially for someone who suffered, if you said that the peace of deep sleep I will extend into eternity, just drop the word death, death and the concept of death. Would you have a problem with that? Absence of the me. That is why Ramana Maharshi said deep sleep is your natural state. Deep sleep is your natural state.
so when you start letting go of your precious judgments and opinions about people about situations about things that is the process of dying because it is the me which holds on to them very strongly it's not that frightening in a sense could be very frightening in another sense because your identification is crumbling and then we start accepting when things don't go our way much easier maharaj had said the expected seldom happens the unexpected always does how much are we going to shield ourselves from that how much how much armor how many walls are we going to build try and protect whom is endless to try and protect something which does not exist in deep sleep so it becomes a process of letting go and when the letting go starts happening the light starts shining more and more the light of presence of silence which is not the chatter of the thinking mind that is what it means by silence is golden it's not just a phrase pulled out from thin air silence is golden is referring to the light So Rohan, you've been here before, I think. Yes. Yeah. What's your name? Mohan. Mohan. Do you follow any particular? Uh, 
Have you come before here? What's your name? Mayur. Mayur. And you have uh, a particular background uh, going to Saman? Yeah, I'm with Rohan. Rohan. Oh, Rohan College. You're in good company. Okay, okay. I remember when I was with Eckhart, whenever I was with him, what I liked was he was a man of few words, you could say, like even I, I am, I was. So there was no compulsion or need to keep talking when you were with him or, you know, we would take walks or it was so beautiful to be in that space of just being who you are and he being who he is. For me, that was quite something when I was very young. I remember at uh, when I visited his home in Vancouver with my sister and her friends, there was a forest just outside. You walk for 10 minutes and you walk into the forest. So we followed him through the forest. And the only words I remember, there was one tree which had fallen. I have a photograph in that tree. And he just pointed at it. We were walking behind him. He was walking very fast. I think none of us could keep pace. And he just pointed and said, form dissolving and continued walking. <laughs> that got stuck in my mind. Form dissolving. Everything arises and goes in one's consciousness, isn't it? You know, you feel that you've come from somewhere here and you're looking at me. Which is not really the truth. The truth is everything is appearing in your consciousness. It is the other way around. Did you leave that field of consciousness ever? Things are appearing. It it's just popping up and going, popping up and going. You leave this place, you want to see a road pop up, you want to see cars pop up. You're going to go home, you'll see your family members pop up. And then dissolve. <coughs> Next one comes, the previous one dissolves. Next one comes, the previous one dissolves. Like this. What is it which stays in which all this is happening? Isn't that who you are? That reality starts sinking in, which Maharaj would refer to as abide in your beingness. It's just fantastic. Now it's my voice. When he goes out, He'll hear Rohan's voice. When Rohan goes home, he'll hear another friend's voice. He'll hear his parents' voice. What is closest to you is your own consciousness. What a fantastic Maya.
and this forms dissolving also reminds me of i think i've written about this it must be somewhere on the net again when i was probably in my late 20s and uh, ekhart had come to india and no sorry he came in to uh, 2001 or 2 2002 and uh, we went to pondicherry he was giving a talk in pondicherry so i met him there and a few of us stayed at this hotel together now i was quite i would say sad in a sense because my grandmother had passed away the night before and it was very strange because i was wondering whether to cancel my trip to meet ekhart in tiruvannamalai and pondicherry because she was still in the icu and uh, my mother said no you go because you know this is inevitable we are all here you know other people family members are around so you don't cancel your trip but it so happened that she passed away that night the funeral was in the morning and my flight which was the scheduled flight in the afternoon i caught that same flight to go and meet ekhart in pondicherry so then uh, we were sitting uh, in the group it was dinner time and there was a large table of where most of the group was sitting waiting for ekhart and me and a friend of mine took a smaller table because i was not really in the mood to socialize and just wanted to be quiet so ekhart had come and uh, you know the big table got up but we found him coming to our table and he sat down and so we were talking so i asked him this question which was on my mind so i told ekhart that you know i had a dog which died probably a year ago at that time and i said he used to stay, uh, be mostly in the near the front door so you know anyone who walked in you'd see him first so after he died when i would come home what i saw was a vacuum because the dog was no longer there and you feel the absence so i told like heart that that's happened with the dog i said now my grandmother has passed away so whenever the thought of her arises i feel a, a vacuum so he said so what is the question he knew i was wanting to ask something so i said my question is what would happen if everything you loved and cherished died at the same time so he said what do you think is the answer so i said look for me my dog died i felt a vacuum because there was something there which has gone my grandmother died i felt a vacuum there was something there it is gone so for me if everything i loved and cherished died at the same time there would be a vacuum all around right and his answer was that is what enlightenment is which actually means not that everything has to die physically but the identification what we derive a sense of self from when that goes that is what enlightenment is which was very beautiful because you don't care when you read in the papers about someone else being murdered you may feel oh you know all the news which comes is so negative but do we really feel it we don't because we are concerned with me and mine the death of the me and the mine is the death of the identification 
It doesn't mean not loving people. It does not mean that. It's to see that death of identification is this. That is why the Sufis, the mystics, the masters, they have love for all of humanity. Not for the me and the mine. Not a restricted love. I don't remember if it was Ram Krishna or one of the Indian sages who said, a real mother is not the mother who feels only her own child's pain, but for all the children in the universe. That is the enlightened way of living. Then there's no me and mine. All there is, is consciousness. Anyone wants to share anything or any questions? You mentioned this story before. Hmm. And it's a very powerful thing to contemplate. I don't have to, I think a year ago mm -hmm. you mentioned the same incident. And uh, it is just stuck in my head. Hmm. Because it's uh, Everybody can 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 experience it themselves, and it, it makes you feel something. You know, hmm. it's very beautiful. Really, not even beautiful. Something else is uh, very immediate. Hmm. You know, it just uh, makes you stop thinking about things and just. Uh, 